But good morning and welcome to Christchurch once again. My name is the Reverend Nick Williams and I'm the vicar of the church family. And it's my pleasure also to welcome members of Bertham Church who are joining us this morning. It's great to have you with us. Our theme this week is encourage one another. Uh, we've been doing or we're halfway through a series on the one another's in scripture. So far we've considered what it means to love one another. Last week we thought about what it means to forgive one another. And this morning Jolien Tricky is our preacher and he'll be helping us think through this theme of encouraging one another. But let's begin with a prayer, a wonderful uh, prayer which I'm sure we are all familiar with. Faithful one whose word is life. Come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's great to have Anna with us this morning, who's going to be leading us in our song worship. And our first hymn is a favourite of mine, Come Behold the Wondrous mystery and it really unpacks the glory of the person of Christ whom we uh, were made to behold and each of the verses tells something of the story of the person of Jesus Christ. The first verse focuses on the birth of Christ, verse 2 on the life of Christ, verse 3 on the death of Christ and verse 4 on the resurrection of Christ. Welcome everybody and thank you for um, meeting with us today as we come together and please join myself and my lovely family as we worship our wonderful and powerful God.
thank you. We're going to come to our confession now. The words will come up on the screen. And again, I, uh, as usual, I would invite you to join in, in the words that are in bold. But let's just pause for a moment. Let's ask God to bring to mind those things we need to seek his forgiveness for. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We've lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We've lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, before Jolien comes to uh, speak this morning, I thought it would be good to find out a little bit more about uh, Jolien. Some of us, uh, certainly at Christchurch, will uh, know Jolien, uh, others perhaps not so. So uh, I took the opportunity earlier in the week to ask him a few uh, questions, an opportunity for him to introduce himself and also say a little bit about his current work. Jolien, great to have you with us this morning. Uh, you're known to quite a few of us at Christchurch, there might be one or two who haven't been around when you've preached before, and obviously uh, we're being joined by Burton Church this morning. So I wonder if you could begin by just introducing yourself. Well, I have to say probably I'm the other Joe Tricky, so I'm father-in-law to Joe Tricky, the curate at Christchurch. Um, I'm Joshua's father, married to Francis, who's the vicar of Oxshot. Um, I was for 14 years uh, vicar of uh, Buzzbridge and I have been uh, a fairly regular visitor to Christchurch especially at eight o'clock um, and I've been free to do that because uh, I resigned my post as a church leader south of Bristol to allow Francis to become the vicar of Oxshot here. So what's your role now? Mm. Well uh, my job title um, one of my two actually is uh, Intentional Discipleship Coordinator uh, for the entire Anglican Communion at the Anglican Communion Office. Wow, that's, that's a great letterhead. Uh, <laughs> what on earth does that mean in practice? Well, uh, it, it springs out of the fact that in 2016, the Anglican Church, the Anglican Consultative Council, recognised the need uh, for every uh, province, diocese and church to intentionally disciple their members. Uh, and that's because disciple, uh, people don't become followers of Jesus, uh, mature followers of Jesus by accident. They never did. If you think of Jesus, he, he deliberately asked people, will you come and follow me? And then he invested in them over two or three years uh, sharing his life with them and he taught them in practice to obey his commandments and then he said go and do the same so we've slightly forgotten I think particularly in the Church of England in significant parts of it somehow thinking that you can do that by symbiosis or by going through the lectionary occasionally in services you know and, and actually you need much more intentional and deliberate if we're going to form the whole people of God to be disciples so my role is to work with people uh, in 41 now yeah, 41 provinces um, nine regions hundreds of dioceses but to try and facilitate and encourage that so in the Church of England 
where does that issue, where does it show? And the answer is it shows in a thing called setting God's people free, which is about empowering the whole people of God. Uh, it shows itself in the bubbling up to the surface of two priorities in this diocese, growing disciples and making disciples. Um, and in a thing called everyday faith, you can go and look up, which is about helping individuals um, live their faith every day. So that would be an example locally. Yeah, yeah. I think there's about 10 questions coming out of my head at the moment. <laughs> I bet there are, yeah. Let's, uh, uh, Stick to your scripted ones. <laughs> um, we're going to hear from you a little later in our service on the theme of encouraging one another. I wonder, can you remember a, a time when you were encouraged and the impact that it had on you? Well, interesting. I find that I think of people rather than occasions primarily. So a, a wonderful example would be my parents-in-law, who over 35 plus years have demonstrated a belief in me and constantly encouraged me in a way that's just, it's a deep, deep in, um, empowerment, their belief in me. Um, but I, I suppose another example particularly would be, I were in Busbridge early on in my ministry, often leading and preaching at four services on a Sunday, maybe more. I would end up on Mondays very weary and I had developed this particular relationship with somebody other people found rather difficult and nearly approaching 90 year old almost blind lady, very reactionary in her views and had refused to ever learn the new Lord's Prayer and things like that. But I struck a particular relationship with, me, with her. She realized how I sometimes felt on a Monday morning and she took it upon herself to ring me at 9.30 in the morning every Monday. And I called her general encourager because she was slightly military in the way she spoke. You know, and that was what she did. But, but she literally carried me through the first few years of my ministry in Busbridge by that practical, just ringing up saying, how are you? Um, and expressing that sort of concern. You know, so there, yeah, yeah, very deep trans, life transforming and life giving encouragement. Yeah. And that's quite insightful, isn't it? Your general encourager uh, to sort of recognise what it's often like for clergy on a Monday morning, sort of the, uh, the yeah, yeah. after and um, yeah, yeah, well, wonderful. Yeah. And, and that example yeah. of your, your in-laws as well. Uh, sort of sometimes it seems that the church is <clears throat> as good as it thinks it is in encouraging my perception. Why do you think that is? And, and why is it important? I mean, I do think that, particularly in this country, there is a prevailing culture of negativity and criticism that sort of is a default mindset, and the church is not um, without that. And I think actually in a strange way, particularly when, if you focus too much on the vicar as the person who is everything to everybody, there's a ludicrous expectation, and you get huge built-in disappointment if you focus wrongly on the church leader as somehow um, the be all and end all. So, so th I think there can be a real problem with, with that sort of thing. Um, and you're right that clergy do need encouragement. So there's a sense in which people can assume that the people who know what they're doing don't need encouraging. So you, you forget to encourage the people you value most. A bit like you forget to say I love you to the people you love most. So I think there are several reasons and I think it's important um, because I've learned myself. You know, so I'm very much actually by training as a lawyer, a cup half empty, allenized, pull things apart person. And I've realized I have to choose to top up the positive half and to be a general encourager, choose to do that. Um, and it transforms it's transformed me when people have done it to me it transforms the church when the church does it habitually and practices that habit i think that practice is really important isn't it and and um, i just want to say here that i haven't paid you to say that about uh, encouraging the the leader but but i guess it applies across the staff team doesn't it, uh, it mm. oh, yeah. i um, often think often people like youth youth workers children's and families workers often go under the radar because they're not seen on a Sunday morning because they're in their 
their groups, but, but they likewise need a lot of encouragement. And perhaps one of the things that I've sort of realized over the last few years is actually to be much more intentionally encouraging of the senior staff in the diocese, sort of recognizing that they must get huge yeah. amounts of uh, criticism and emails. And so I've sort of uh, tried to sort of get into a routine of looking at every opportunity for, for saying well done and thank you. And, you know, and actually yeah. Yeah. the more you do it, the more it becomes natural. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Jaylene, you've got you're, you're talking to two churches here, uh, not just Christchurch, but Bertram as well. So, how can we encourage one another better? If there was sort of one sort of you know top tip that you were to give to say, this I, is I, I can't I can't do it in one. I can't put it into one. practice. I to, yeah, okay. okay. I think I think it's I do think it's adopting a mindset. You know, I will be for people, and I'll let them know that. Even if they let me down, I will let them know, the, you know that I'm for them. I think it's, there's a lot about noticing what people are doing, um, how they might be feeling, um, and especially, you know, especially these, but it can be anybody. It can be the unnoticed person that you notice that they're doing something and then you affirm them in the doing of it. Um, and then I do think that, that, that the practice of the habit of encouraging at every opportunity, and that can be in words, it can be in um, little acts of kindness. So there's a lady in our congregation here who makes us the most amazing macaroons every so often and delivers them to the door in lockdown. It's just a little, I value you, I appreciate you. Here's what I can do, I can cook. Wonderful, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great, great advice. Jerry, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from you a little later in our service on that theme of encouraging one another. Thank Good. Well, you. thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure. Yeah. God bless. Fantastic. Well, we'll be hearing from Jerry in a few moments. But uh, before he speaks, we're going to have our Bible reading now. And Rob and Joan from Bertham are going to open up the scriptures for us. We first meet Joseph called Barnabas. And this is a reading from Acts chapter 4. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. In this reading, we hear of Barnabas's advocacy on behalf of Saul, the feared persecutor. Acts chapter 9. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus, by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And finally, we hear of Barnabas encouraging the Christians, the first Christians, and recruiting Paul to take the lead in this great task. Acts chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. 
Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Good morning. It's uh, lovely to be with you from my sitting room in Oxshot Vicarage. I gather two Christian communities uh, together. I love teaching about spiritual gifts, God's wonderful means of equipping the whole people of God to be the body of Christ. In Romans 12, which we didn't have read, there are a list of gifts, prophecy, preaching, teaching, leadership. I identify with those, but there are two that stand out and excite me for their potential to transform the life of a church. And they are the ones either side of the teaching gift. And so in chapter 12 and verse 7, we read, if it is serving, let a person serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. You see, I think those two gifts are the closest you get to the character of Christ and the personal work of the Holy Spirit. Let me explain using the Greek words, which on this occasion at least are important. So the word for serving is diakonian, the word we use for the diaconate, once a servant, always a servant. And it's exactly the same word as was used in John in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, when Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He's using that word diakonoi, diakonos. In the same way, the gift of encouragement, the Greek word used there, is parakalon. Parakalon, that's familiar. Yes, it is. John chapter 14, verse 16, when Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit, the word he uses in the Greek is paraclete, the one alongside. So the person who exercises the gift of encouragement inhabits the space of the Holy Spirit as the great comforter, exhorter, encourager and guide. Small wonder that I think this gift has potential to transform the church. So a person who encourages, a church that's full of people who encourage, is a person or is a church full of the Holy Spirit? Which brings me to our Acts readings, and let's pray before we dive into those. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your spirit now into each of our hearts and minds to enthuse us, inform us as to the significance of this gift and habit of encouraging one another, that we might transform our churches. In Jesus' name, Amen. So the greatest example 
of an encourager in the Bible is the man called Barnabas. At least that's what I think. We first come across him in Acts chapter 4. You might want to just look at that. Where he walks onto the stage as a specific example of what is happening uh, across the people uh, of God, those early believers. But of course, he's not introduced as Barnabas. His name is Joseph. But he is named for what he is and does as a son of encouragement. And it's fascinating to look at what he does because he begins with an act of self-offering and service. Verse 36 of chapter 4. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Here is a man making a choice, going to the, disciples, the apostles and the disciples and putting at their feet. It's rather like in the scene in John 13, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. That's what it's like. It's, it's a serve, an act of service. And it's a specific tangible one because he sold his property and he's dedicating himself and his whole life and all his resources to them, to the church and to God's work in the world. That's what he's doing, making a choice. A son of encouragement is born. This shift in name relates to my friend. Her name was Miriam, 88, 89. Uh, and for several years, she served me. She encouraged me, the teacher. You could look at her and say, well, she's almost blind, full of self-doubt when you talk to her, very limited in what she could do. But she chose, she began. A commitment to ring me faithfully 9.30 every Monday morning. And when she rang to serve me, she encouraged me, sometimes with the word uh, or a particular thought uh, or listening to me. She just was there for me and she transformed my early church leadership. Her name was Miriam. But she became, for me, general encourager, a daughter of encouragement. So if you are an encourager, I want to thank you for what you bring into the life of your church and to those around you. You present the spirit of God to people. If you're not such an encourager, but you'd like to be, then listen to this story of Barnabas and ponder what you need to do. So firstly, maybe it's a decision, a specific act of self-offering, maybe some sort of sacrifice or commitment. Maybe I need to make a particular choice. How can I tangibly demonstrate my willingness to serve, to honour, to affirm, to encourage, to exhort, to be alongside others in the church and in the world. And when you do that, you need to have in mind Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. Uh, count others better than yourselves. Look to their interests rather than to your own. That's what you're committing to do. So having made a commitment, what does it play out like in practice? Well, let's look at Barnabas uh, later inputs. So we jump to chapter 9 uh, and there we find the story of this man, Saul, now Paul, wandering around preaching, but understandably because he's persecuted and maybe even put to death Christians. He's feared. What happens? Well, it says Barnabas, but Barnabas, took him and brought him to the apostles. Here is one literally alongside. He becomes the advocate for Paul. No doubt he went to get him, potentially discouraged and rebuffed. Uh, what would have happened if Barnabas had never gone to seek Paul out, to encourage him and say, we'll do this together, let's go, and had interpreted and spoken up for him? 
So Barnabas is somebody who is encouraging and intervening. You can see what is needed in the encourager, sometimes quite a lot of bravery. And it's a physical act. It's a deliberate uh, act as well. It's a, come on, we'll go together. But look again, look again at Barnabas a couple of chapters later. And here we're in the church in Antioch. And suddenly Christians amongst the Gentiles uh, start exploring faith. A church is born. Who do they send to deal with this? They don't send somebody who's going to be critical. They send a son of encouragement, Barnabas. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw, because the encourager sees what God is doing, the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the law with all their hearts. He doesn't see their flaws and their faults. He sees their potential and he begins to build into them and encourage them. But more than that, uh, Barnabas does something else fascinating, because in the next couple of verses, verse 25 of 11, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. See, he goes, well, who do I need to use here? Who can do this better than me? And he goes off and has to physically go visit him. And you can imagine him coming alongside Paul, exhorting and encouraging him to leave behind whatever he's doing and go to Antioch. This is worthwhile you're doing it, encouraging him. And they go and it bears fruit because there, as a result of Paul and Barnabas teaching, people are first recognised as Christians. And then you carry on through chapters 13 and 14 and you see these two people inseparable. But we don't know so much about Barnabas because he lets Paul shine. He's content to be behind on the one who encourages. And later in chapter 15, again, we see even when they argue, why do they argue? Because Barnabas is, sees the potential in Mark and is prepared to commit to him. And only later does Paul see the value of that. So what would it mean practically for you and me to be encouragers? Well, it might require that decision. But then it involves coming alongside people. It's a God-given gift, this ability, but we can exercise and grow it where we reassure, strengthen, affirm the discouraged and those who are wavering in faith. It's about seeing and responding to people's needs and valuing their potential above all, what God is doing in their lives. Encouraging, challenging, motivating them to grow and be who God wants them to be. It's about being alongside people as they take action, supporting being in a supportive role, sometimes invisible. Now, especially if you, like me, have a slightly negative and critical mindset, maybe you're trained like a lawyer, as I was, then you need to choose and learn and practice this new positive input into people's lives. It needs to be a decision and then something you practice. And it's about looking to the needs of others, counting them literally better than yourself. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. And the wonderful thing is it doesn't matter how lowly you may feel. You can have such an amazing positive impact. You can become a great encourager. What do you have to do? Well, look and see and listen and notice what God is doing and how a person may be feeling. You have to affirm and encourage them. Maybe as my parents-in-law did, by somehow and in various ways, making someone know that you are for them, rather like God and the Holy Spirit are always for us. And how do you do that practically? Well, it's often through words, catching somebody's eye, making them stop and saying something affirming. Or like the child with their hair lip in a class, who one day heard the teacher whisper into their ear, I wish you were my child and it changed her life. Maybe it's for you about gifts and actions. Maybe it's about making those macaroons or marmalade 
or cake and delivering it. Maybe it's like it's sending text messages, as I often do, to people on the other side of the world, simply to encourage them. Maybe it's about affirming what you see of God's gifts and work in someone. Maybe sometimes it's a firm, guiding word. Certainly it may need to be a presence alongside somebody in the thick of a difficult situation or speaking up for them in a meeting, standing alongside them. Maybe as you ponder this, you can think of particular people who need your encouragement or for whom you have in your circle the opportunity to encourage and build them up. You need to start where you are and begin practicing encouraging one another. I guarantee that if you do, you will notice both in your own life and in the community you belong to, that gradually you and that community are filled with, renewed and built up in, the Holy Spirit of God. Because when you are an encourager, you are embodying the Spirit of God, the great encourager. And I pray that you will resolve to be an encourager and you will practice this from now on, more and more. Amen. I want to say a big thank you to Jolien for his talk this morning and for the real encouragement that it's been to us as we've thought about that theme of what it means to encourage one another and to Anna for leading us in that last song. We're going to turn to prayer now and over now to uh, Benji. Well greetings from the McNair Scots. Let us pray. At the end of each prayer we will say the words Lord in your mercy. The responses here are prayer. Eternal Father, we join together in praying to you for the needs of the church, the world, our communities and ourselves. 
trusting in your love, which reaches out from before the foundation of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Almighty God, Great Shepherd, we pray for your church. We pray for our archbishops, Justin and Stephen, for all bishops, particularly Bishop Andrew and Bishop Joe, that you might grant them wisdom and strength for their vocations. Similarly, we pray for ourselves at Christchurch, for Nick and the staff team at the PCC, that you might grant them wisdom too in all their decisions at this time. Communal God, as churches of all denominations open their doors again, draw each community together to worship you in spirit and truth, but also in practical safety, mindful of the measures that will keep each member safe. By your spirit, enable all the members of your body, like Barnabas, to encourage one another as well as to serve the wider community. Enable your body to identify current needs of grief, loneliness and isolation, acutely felt at this time by some. May your church minister to those who suffer. We also pray for our brothers and sisters who endure persecution for the sake of the gospel. Grant them and us courage to hold out the word of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Wonderful counsellor, we pray for your world. We pray for our government that you might grant them wisdom, both for their service to our nation and in their international relations too. We pray for our MPs. We ask that you might grant them grace to seek to do what is right and represent the, their constituents faithfully. All powerful God, who brings life out of death, good out of evil, we ask that you might redeem the situation that our nation and world finds itself in with this pandemic. Please have mercy upon us and turn it to the good. God of wholeness, we pray also for pupils and teachers, those who have started their holiday and those who will shortly. Please grant them time for recuperation and refreshment after what has been for many a challenging term. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving God and Lord of life, we pray for those who are facing troubles, whether illness, job insecurity, financial worries, relationship difficulties, bereavement or any other type of trouble. Grant them courage and hope. And in the quiet of our hearts, we bring them before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Faithful God, we thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer. As we look forward to the week to come, we pray for an awareness of your love and support in all we do. Merciful, Merciful Father, Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for the, the sake, sake of your Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, who is, is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Right, thank you so much, Benji. We're now going to sing our final song, a wonderful uh, worship song, which is familiar, I know, to both our churches. What a beautiful name.
and I thank you so much for leading us in our song worship this morning. Uh, now here at Christchurch uh, we always try and celebrate birthdays or anniversaries. Uh, the only birthday that I'm aware of uh, was that of Richard King who celebrated a significant birthday yesterday. Richard we hope you had a fantastic day. Uh, there's going to be a uh, coffee uh, via Zoom, a virtual coffee via Zoom at 11 o'clock, certainly at Christchurch, uh, I suspect also at Burfham Church. And then for uh, this evening here at Christchurch, we have our six o'clock informal service via Zoom, eCube meets at 7.30. Well, let's uh, have a final prayer. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself, the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the risen Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>